Okay, uh, friends, I, I, I want to thank you for um, uh, join, joining me in this uh, um, uh, in this presentation. Um, you know, Joy covered a lot of the 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 historical um, uh, issues that that are are so critical, and it's a nice. Uh, backdrop uh, uh, to this. When she was showing those photos, I was thinking about uh, uh, when I was uh, a teaching, uh, I'm a, re a retired history professor. I taught for about 38 years at, at Michigan State and uh, uh, beginning in the early uh, uh, 1970s, I taught a course called uh, The History of uh, Ethnocentrism uh, and Racism. Uh, because I wanted students to understand uh, uh, ethnocentrism from a global historical perspective. And then uh, I spent time looking at uh, racism in the, uh, in, in the U.S. This other tradition uh, uh, approach uh, came about through years and years of not only teaching but research, and I'd just like to share a few things with you and then I'll, I'll read a few uh, uh, pieces uh, uh, from several books that, that also help to explain this. Whenever I was teaching um, the, uh, the course on the history of racism, I noticed several dynamics. One was that um, when the kids left the course, um, uh, Joy talks about people being traumatized, okay? Uh, and my students were obviously very traumatized by all the history, especially when I would talk about uh, 100 years of lynching and, and, and what have you. And the black and white students, when they would leave, oftentimes uh, they couldn't get a handle on, on what they could do afterwards, okay? And so, you know, I, I did that for, for, for many, many years. Uh, and then, um, this was also a period when I, uh, I had become a Baha'i. I, I joined the Baha'i faith in 1962 uh, and um, was very much involved in race relations and race amity and, uh, and, and what have you. I met Smitty, interestingly enough, when he was a teenager uh, 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 in Greenville, uh, uh, South Carolina, where I was uh, teaching uh, uh, of course, I was a, a student at, uh, at Michigan State, uh, uh, actually an uh, uh, undergraduate student in history. And so a group of black and white Baha'is went to Greenville, South Carolina to conduct uh, sort of classes for uh, black students who were going into um, the uh, previously segregated schools. And so I was a major in African history uh, at Michigan State. Uh, and so I was telling them about African civilizations and what have you. And uh, Smitty was, uh, uh, was there, but S Smitty was older, but his younger brother was there. And so uh, Smitty talks about that experience and talks about how uh, he, you know, he was surprised to hear about African civilizations and the University of Timbuktu and, 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 and what have you. Well, to make a long story sh uh, short, uh, uh, th uh, throughout the 60s, being involved in various aspects of, of, of race relations, Black Student Alliance at Michigan State, uh, and of course, you know, being traumatized by the riots of 1967 in Detroit, uh, you know, I was there, and I can recall when the National Spiritual Assembly came to Detroit uh, and met with uh, a group of us. Uh, not only did they meet with the local Spiritual Assembly, but they also met with a group of uh, uh, sort of angry African-American youth, myself included, who was trying to make sense of, of, of all that uh, that was happening. And I think that was one of the reasons why I became interested uh, in race relations. Uh, and so as I started teaching uh, about race relations, um, I discovered that I needed to broaden it, not to ignore, you know, the horrendous history of racism, but I needed to broaden it because there was something missing. And what was missing uh, was the interracial, multiracial uh, struggle for racial justice, okay? And it wasn't as if 
uh, these things were hidden. They were there, but scholars over the years, understandably, tended to focus on, 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 on those aspects. But I needed to figure out how I could address these issues. Now, as a Baha'i, I noticed that there were all kinds of dynamics going on in the Baha'i community, that the Baha'i, notwithstanding its own, you know, uh, uh, challenges, uh, uh, had always been involved in trying to develop first an interracial and then a multiracial community. And so as a young uh, scholar, I would often ask myself, how could I replicate what's going on in the Baha'i community? The Baha'i community was like a laboratory for me. How could I replicate that in my classroom, okay? And, and how could I use that as a, a research model not to impose upon the study of, of racism, but at least to, to have it as an organizing thing to look for other kinds of, of, of uh, you know, perspectives and, and what have you. So let me share with you uh, 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 several uh, things that led me to this. First, in, 19, in the 1980s, uh, early 1980s, uh, uh, I was a young uh, a professor. Uh, I don't think I had tenure then. But I was working with two Baha'is and a non-Baha'i, and we wrote a book called Detroit, Race and Uneven Development. Uh, it was published by Temple University Press, and interestingly enough, even though it's an old, dated uh, book, uh, it's still being used in, in sociology classes. I think one of the reasons why it's still being used is because it was one of the first books that really dealt uh, 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 in some depth with the history of racism uh, in Detroit in the post-1940 uh, 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 period. Now, in the, when we were working on that book, um, it was at the time when I was also trying to figure out how to look at this other tradition. <coughs> Excuse me. And I can recall talking to the sociologist and talking to uh, the two Baha'is, one was my wife, who's, who was a professor of urban planning, and one was uh, Joe Darden, who was a well-known uh, a scholar uh, in, in, in race relations. I was trying to, to um, uh, sort of explain to them the importance of not only working on or looking at racism in Detroit, but also looking at those <coughs> efforts uh, of people to try to address racism. I didn't call it the other tradition then, but I felt obligated as a Baha'i to try and widen my research perspective, you know. Uh, and it wasn't difficult to do because there were all of these people out there actually doing things. So I wasn't coming up with some fiction, you see. But interestingly enough, there were colleagues both who were working on the book and who were not working on the book uh, who were arguing that you know, you, there really is no history of interracial cooperation. I mean, come on, look at Detroit. I mean, you know, you're from Detroit, Richard. I mean, you should know better, you see. Uh, uh, but they were wrong, okay? And so I started uh, working on the chapter in the book called Racial Conflict and Cooperation, okay? Um, and basically uh, pointing out to folk the role of interracial uh, organizations like Focus Hope, and I'll talk about them a little bit more, um, which was an organization started by uh, Father Cunningham and Eleanor J Josephus right at uh, uh, or during the post-1967 uh, riot. When that riot occurred, this minister uh, or this priest uh, uh, and um, his assistant began organizing this group. To this day, they are still around and they're still doing very important uh, things. Uh, also, I uh, talked about um, New Detroit, which was another coalition, uh, and uh, they are uh, also still around, and this is well over 40, uh, 40 years, okay? And so these were the, these were the, the, um, the, the uh, sort of the, the starting point for this, you know, for looking at this other tradition. Now, one other point before I uh, 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 go on. In the 1980s, uh, do you all recall the riots that occurred in, well, some of you might be too young, uh, but there were riots that took place in England in the 18, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in the 19, in the, in, no, in the 19, in the 1980s. Uh, I was teaching a course uh, 
um, uh, in England in 1976, uh, and they were sort of oblivious of, of you know, well they, met, they weren't oblivious of race relations, but they didn't think it was a big thing. I was asked uh, uh, to return in 1981 along with uh, uh, Dean Joe Darton, uh, who was a Baha'i in Michigan State, uh, uh, and Milton Kilson from Harvard. Three uh, or four American scholars uh, were asked to, uh, uh, to, to uh, visit the University of Warwick, where they were having a conference on race relations. I was asked primarily because of the work that I had done on Detroit, okay? And my uh, 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 paper basically focused on how interracial groups uh, formed after the riots of 43 and the riots of 67. And don't forget, these were the two worst race riots that had ever occurred uh, in an American city. And so that's one reason why, you know, they, they, they asked me to, to come and, and, and give a talk. Interestingly enough, when I was given the talk about what happened after that, there was still a lot of resistance. You know, people were, were, were still understandably uh, doubtful that anything could happen after a riot. And I can recall that there were, you know, uh, Afro, uh, you, you know, call them Afro-Britishers or what have you, you know, you know uh, who were very concerned about, well, you know, things will never get right. Uh, and I don't see, you know, how you could say that these things really occurred uh, after the riots in 43 and 67. But the evidence was there. Uh, the question might have been how efficacious these efforts were, okay? But still, I felt that it was very important uh, to continue uh, uh, the work. Then in the early uh, uh, 90s, uh, friends, and I, I want uh, to get some, just a few readers here, so I decided to um, um, uh, uh, write another piece. This was the, the origins of the other tradition. It was called The Other Tradition uh, in American Race Relations. And if somebody could just read the first paragraph there. Sure this was published by the Association of Baha'i Studies. Um, uh, and it's, it, it really deals with the history of racism in the U.S. When Joy uh, was talking about Thomas Jefferson, there's a whole chapter in there that talks about uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, the premier you know, race, uh, racial ideologue, okay? Um, but one of the things that I try to focus on here um, uh, in, this, uh, in this book, uh, I, was, I was trying to flesh out this notion of the other tradition. This is the first time that I did it. So just read that, you know, that, uh, that piece as loud as, uh, uh, as you can. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. Understanding the other tradition. The long and terrible overshadowing tradition of racism and a radical conflict in the United States has prevented many concerned people from examining the other traditions of American race relations that have embodied the best of American thinking and vision concerning a, a multiracial society. While far from what we in the 1980s would call progressive, race relations, this tradition not only changed the more popular tradition of white racism during each stage of its development, but at the same time held before the eyes of the largest society the vision of the multiracial society based upon a radical justice, unity, and cooperation. It did not emerged fully defined, rather, it uh, stumbled along, sometimes losing its way, and also struggling to overcome the influences of the stronger tradition of racism. Yet it is this other tradition that has paved the way to a greater vision of society free of other racism and full of human love and fellowship. Okay, wow. so basically, uh, uh, friends, um, now keep in mind, all of the things that Jory talked about are very important for us to understand because those things happened and people are still being traumatized by them. And at the same time, there's a tradition that runs uh, alongside of it, however uh, uh, undeveloped, uh, that has always played an important role in trying to address those issues. And so that's, that's uh, one of the things that you know, I'm particularly concerned about. Now here is another um, a piece of this. Sage Publication uh, uh, is a social science uh, 
um, a publication that uh, asked uh, scholars of race relations to write, you know, certain books. And so they asked uh, uh, it, me to, uh, uh, to write a book that would sort of expand this notion, okay? And so I'm going to ask uh, uh, my good brother here, you see, uh, uh, just to read that. Yeah. This book is based on the belief that the more we know about the history of interracial unity and cooperation, the better equipped we will be in our efforts to improve race relations in contemporary society. This history will play a vital role in transforming the racial perceptions of many blacks and whites who have lost faith in the possibility of improving race relations in the near future. Blacks will come to understand that throughout the history of white racial oppression, white allies fought alongside blacks in the struggle against racism. In that struggle, many bonds of genuine love and affection were created, thus transcending the racist history that constantly bore down on them. Young African Americans today, whether on college campuses or in inner cities, who have lost faith in Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream of the beloved community of blacks and whites struggling together against <coughs> racial oppression, might find in these pages convincing examples of how many blacks and whites struggled together for decades to overcome racial oppression. Now understand, friends, that if you are teaching black and white and Hispanic and Native American students, uh, after you've done it for decades, you feel obligated at one point to make sure that, number one, they have some type of perspective on race that will sort of help them to engage in the struggle, okay? Uh, and secondly, uh, you want them to understand something about this legacy. And so what this essentially is, uh, and it's very, you know, there's a lot more work that has to be done. But this is just a look uh, at some of these examples. I have about, uh, about 18, okay, uh, but just some of these examples um, that I've used over the years to inspire students uh, to become involved uh, in, uh, in the struggle. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, getting off track, I just wanted to quickly, if you could go back to the, uh, the race riots in Detroit. Was there one incident that triggered it, or was it just obviously it was accumulating, but was yeah. there anything in particular? Well, hold that, hold that sure. question. Sure. Yeah, we just finished a, a 900 page book on. <laughs> <laughs> on the race riots that will come out next next year, but I'll deal with that. Sure, sure. You don't want to get me started on that. <laughs> that has been my area of research for thirty years, and I, you know. <laughs> we'll make Smitty make it longer. But, but, we, but, we, but we, we, we we'll you know sure. uh, uh, we, we'll talk about that. But anyway, the the, the other thing um, that uh, I, I want you to keep in mind is that when you have young people. Um, depending on you to teach them about race relations, they're also dependent on you uh, to give them some kind of map to engage in race relations. And one of the things that I was particularly concerned about is that my black and white students oftentimes were, were, were so upset, okay, uh, that they didn't quite know, you know, how to pull together a map, okay, or what map to follow. And so, that led later on to our uh, development organization called the Multiracial Unity Leadership or, or Living Experience, and I'll talk about that uh, later on. So here, here are some of the objectives. Uh, uh, help students understand the historical and social significance, significance of the other tradition. Inspire students to engage in, and this is very important, in activities that promote cooperation among racially and culturally diverse peoples. Uh, help students recognize the tradition at work in the present and encourage them to become involved in projects that promote multiracial cooperation and unity and encourage faculty members to focus some of their scholarly and teaching efforts on multiracial cooperation and unity. Now, I've noticed that whenever I've given this talk, people have understandably said, well, uh, you're talking about cooperation among people. Uh, are you just talking about friendship groups and, you know, people, you know, having coffee together and, and, and what have you? Uh, and what I tried to point out, that many of the major movements that have affected change 
in the society have been built upon this multiracial uh, unity and cooperation. And we will identify, you know, uh, several uh, of those, okay? Uh, this is also very important. Some of you might remember the conflict between black and Jewish faculty on college campuses when many uh, uh, black student organizations uh, were bringing Minister Farrakhan to campus, okay? And so, and I had, you know, several students who were members of the Nation of Islam and, and what have you. Uh, but what we tried to do is to bring uh, Jewish and black faculty together to try to resolve that and discuss that, you see. And at one point, uh, I was teaching a course on black-Jewish relations uh, with the rabbi, you see. Uh, and it was, an, uh, here again, you know, another uh, effort uh, to address uh, uh, these issues. So, he, so uh, those are the, um, the various uh, uh, objectives. Also, um, I was very concerned about um, uh, looking at this other tradition as a research and teaching project, you know, understanding, uh, expand the understanding of the racial history of the United States. And, he, and here again, uh, uh, this, this would sort of uh, complement or, or, or sort of uh, be in addition to many of the things that Joy was pointing out, okay, uh, expanding that history. And we're going to be trying to expand uh, uh, the history of, of race relations in Detroit, I mean, I mean, in the United States for many years. But this other tradition is particularly important because we need to get a, uh, a, have a grasp on all of the organizations and institutions and people who have been trying to address the issues of racism. Does that make sense to you? Okay, all right. Um, and the other piece is provide models for white students to emulate. This, I think, is particularly important. If you want to have an effective coalition of blacks and whites working together or, or, or minorities, you know, majorities working together, you absolutely uh, have to have some models for them, okay? They have to be able to look at history and say, okay, here are some models. My white students learned that there were white models throughout history that they could emulate. They could emulate the Grimke sisters, okay, from South Carolina, all right, uh, uh, the daughters of, of, of a slave owner uh, who became avid abolitionists, you see. Uh, they could, they could em emulate any number of people uh, from the Civil Rights Movement, from the Labor Movement, and what have you. They needed to have heroes, all right. When I was teaching race relations for years, I didn't give them those he heroes, okay. Uh, and you can imagine, they were sitting there and they were, you know, seeing pictures of lynching and other kinds of things. And of course, you know, as a young professor, I was beaten up, you know, I had my big afro and my dashiki, and so I was running it on them, okay? And they needed to understand it. But they needed some tools and perspective to be able to get out there and engage uh, 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 these issues. Uh, and when I look back over 30-something years of teaching, uh, I think one of, the, one of my students who I'm most proud of, and there's many others, um, is a Lebanese-American uh, uh, young lady uh, uh, by the name, well, she's not young anymore, she used to be. Okay. <laughs> this shouldn't be on the tape, but, <laughs> but we'll okay. Right okay, all right, okay. Uh, who was a professor at, at Michigan State, uh, and she and I founded a program called the Multi-Racial Unity Living Experience, you know, Professor Jean Gazelle. Okay, uh, and she's been doing great things, not only throughout the United States, but throughout Africa, you see. Uh, and she was in my first class, I think it was about 1972 or, or 73, a little 17-year-old Lebanese-American young lady who remembered the riots uh, and was among several people uh, who took this class because they just needed to know something about race relations. But they also needed some tools, you see. Uh, and so models are particularly important. And then provide models to restore students of color trust and confidence in the protracted struggle for racial justice. And I want to emphasize this, the protracted struggle for racial justice and multiracial cooperation and unity. And it's, it's protracted, it's going to take a while, okay? Uh, and this was particularly important because some of my, my, my uh, um, uh, African-American students were a bit reluctant 
to talk about the history of racial cooperation. And my, my, my uh, black uh, graduate students who helped me with the research, as they were doing the research, they gradually began to find, you know, models uh, that, that they could, you know, uh, appreciate, okay? Now, these are very selected historical examples of interracial and multiracial cooperation and unity and what we can learn from them. There's going to be a lot of questions, guys, that I can't answer. Okay, uh, let, you know, yesterday we just had so many, you know, uh, questions. We won't have time uh, to answer all of them. But these are just some examples that I think is, is, is important uh, for, uh, for people to understand. One of the things that we have to uh, perhaps understand is the quality of race relations um, in the 17th century, okay? What I found very interesting uh, uh, is that um, these two scholars pointed out uh, the po what they call the possibility uh, of a genuine multiracial society became a reality during the years before Bacon's Rebellion. Now, what that says to me is that racism was not inevitable. And I think that is very important for students to understand this, okay? Because uh, we have this mindset uh, that, well, you know, racism has always been a part of American society, which is the reason, you, you know, I'm sorry, let me say that uh, differently. Um, that racism has always been a part of human society and most certainly American society as, uh, as, 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 as well. But you know, we do know that there was a period in American history where there was a great deal of fluidity that race hadn't quite consolidated yet, that the ideology hadn't quite, you know, developed. Uh, it was around in certain places. And that fluidity made it possible uh, to have some relative uh, degree of, of, of equality um, uh, uh, among certain, uh, certain people. Uh, when we look at uh, Bacon's Rebellion, where we see black slaves and white servants uh, um, uh, you know, fighting together, we realized that even though they were united by a common cause, that there was still some degree of inequality. But the main thing that we might want to think about is that why did they even come together to begin with? Okay, what brought them together? And when we think about the period of fluidity, where, for example, uh, you had some relative uh, equality um, um, uh, for, for several generations, then the questions become, how did racism take hold? How did it become an ideology? How did it become institutionalized? Now, for students, this is important to understand only because they need to know that there's always periods of fluidity in a society where things can happen, which is the reason why when I, when I was at, at, at Warwick, I tried to point out to folks the periods of fluidity after the riots of 43 and the riot of 67, where organizations began, notwithstanding all of the, 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 the conflict, uh, to form alliances and affect some change, okay? Now this is, here again, this is why this other tradition of history is important. Most certainly you had all kinds of racism during this period, okay, and Joy has pointed that out, you see. But what do we learn from this? One of the things we learned from this is that when you remember that World War II uh, was a period where you had segregated units, right, okay? What caused black and white soldiers uh, to fight together in the Continental Army. Okay. George Washington earlier didn't want to have any blacks involved. Okay. The blacks petitioned him uh, uh, and, and said that they wanted to, be, to become involved. But at the same time, it was because Lord Dunmore, a British general, uh, had also uh, uh, convinced, or not convinced, but had had been approached by blacks, and, and so uh, uh, Lord Dunmore had black soldiers fighting on the side of the British. So you had these two 
these two groups of, uh, of, of blacks. Now, this integrate, integrated uh, war experience uh, contributed to the emergence of the anti-slavery movement. You know, it played a very important role. Now, the thing about it is that that generation uh, of black and white soldiers, they, they obviously had different motives, okay? But the main thing is that they were working together um, uh, for, let us say, you know, for one, for one purpose, even though there was some, <laughs> you know, different motives. Um, and after that period uh, uh, of war, you had uh, the African-American slaves uh, being freed by what they called a process of manumission. Okay, these were some of the first uh, 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 free slaves. And for a while, you had some white soldiers uh, who had a sense of black humanity. All right. Now we know that much of that was lost, but still it raises questions about how racism formed and how there were pockets of, 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 of interracial uh, cooperation uh, that, need, you know, that needed to be uh, 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 looked at. If any of these examples need more explanation, you know, uh, uh, just, uh, you know, feel free to raise some questions. Could you give us a name of something to follow up on, on the uh, people who got involved in the movement from the Revolutionary War? Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> My you mentioned in your last slide that some, the Revolutionary War helped to start out the, um, the uh, anti-slavery movement. Mm -hmm. Is there any names that we can follow up on? Okay, can I uh, write, write a note down and I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. And then also, uh, Lex, uh, uh, you can flip through that, that piece there on the, on the Revolutionary War, and then I'll get, I'll, I'll get back to you. The, the anti-slavery anti movement, um, this was the first large-scale opportunity for the development of black-white cooperation in the long struggle for racial justice. Interracial cooperation in the Underground Railroad and racial tension, uh, tensions as a developmental stage of, anti, of, of a, the anti-slavery movement. I think that this is particularly important because even though uh, the anti-slavery movement was the first interracial uh, uh, movement for racial justice, and we have to put racial justice in, in, um, in quotes because we know that there were some abolitionists uh, who were anti-slavery but who were not for, for equality. Of, of blacks and whites, okay? And we know that there was also tension between, you know, uh, uh, abolitionists like, you know, uh, 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 Fred Douglas, you see, and uh, tip of my tongue, who was his buddy? No, no, yeah, 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 John, but there was, yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah, conflict between, but there was, uh, uh, it'll, it'll come to me. The, 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 uh, I'm looking right at him. We don't like girls. <laughs> we don't like girls. Oh God, what am I saying? Oh, we don't like girls. Yeah. So we know there was some. That we know that there was some tension between them, and so many people will raise the question uh, about um, the liter the legitimacy of of the anti-slavery movement as a major movement uh, of white cooperation. Uh, I mean, of interracial cooperation. But what we would say is that, look, most certainly you, you saw blacks and whites cooperating in this movement, and most certainly uh, uh, blacks benefited a great deal uh, from it. Uh, but still, uh, it was a movement that was uh, at a certain developmental stage. It was far from perfect, you see, uh, and it, has all, it had all kinds of flaws. But we have to um, uh, consider it as part of this history of the, of the other tradition, you see. This is, this is a model, uh, or I should say um, an example, that some black, uh, um, uh, black and white students tended to uh, um, uh, really internalize. The black students would look at this and say, well, you know, John Brown is an example of, of uh, the degree of personal commitment to end slavery. Maybe we need this type of commitment from 
you know, uh, you know, from my white uh, 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 friends today. So they would they would make they would make that that, that argument, um, and white students uh, would feel redeemed by John Brown because they would say, you know, we have somebody in our history who really played a very important role to the degree that he gave his life and the life of, uh, 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 of his sons. I, would, I used to take my students uh, uh, to um, a certain historical site in Detroit. As you know, Detroit was a very important part of the Underground Railroad. Uh, uh, the slave would, es would escape to Detroit, um, um, and then they would cross the Detroit River to Canada. And I had a little, um, it was a sort of a pilgrimage I would go through with my students. We would go to the historic site where, where blacks would cross the, you know, where they crossed the river, okay, with the help of black and white abolitionists in Detroit. And then we would go to uh, Chatham uh, across the river. Um, and we would visit some of the, the churches. And it was very emotional for me as a historian. Uh, and sometimes the, my students would look at me and say, oh, my gosh, he's getting all romantic and, and what have you. But I would have to say to them, you know, this is where John Brown met with Fred Douglas. Okay, and this is where they, you know, they were thinking about planning the, uh, or where the, you know, where John Brown was trying to get some people to help him, you know, uh, plan this, uh, this, this, this revolution or this revolt at, 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 at Hopper's uh, Ferry. And, of course, um, uh, uh, Douglas wasn't interested in it, you see. Um, but we, we, we talked, we, you know, we, we, we talked about this. Um, this is raising the bar in the interracial struggle for racial justice in the minds of blacks and whites. This is the point at which people were saying, uh, abolitionists and anti-abolitionists, uh, how far is this going to go? You see, John Brown, you know, raised the bar, you see. And, and my white students would look at this and say, okay, he's our hero. And the black students would say, okay, this is one example. Might be an exception, but this is, this is an example of what some whites were willing Robert to do. Richard, you know that John Brown was a pretty wretched person. Well, he, has, he had his flaws, yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah, before, yeah. I mean, before he, before he saw the light, mm -hmm. he, was, he was really wretched. And I think we need to... Keep in mind, you see, I mean, I get very nervous when you talk, start talking about him being a role model for the white students. Mm -hmm. I get real nervous about that. But, but, but this is what we have That's to... probably because of my heritage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what we have to remember, though, Dwight. Uh, notwithstanding some, you know, some of his flaws. Well, I, I'm, I'm with yeah, you. Yeah, okay. In terms of what he did. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just thinking yeah. it's always important... Mm -hmm. to point out that this is an evolutionary process mm -hmm. and that we're all a part of this mm -hmm. constant tension of perfection and imperfection. Yeah, and, that, yeah, and that's why earlier I talked about the abolitionist movement as, as sort of a developmental kind of a thing. You know, beginning with some people who were only interested in moral suasion. You know, you had that group of abolitionists who were saying basically, well, let's, let's just kind of pray and let's just you know, try to persuade people through moral suasion. And then later on, uh, you had, uh, well, William Lord Garrison was in that camp as well. And then later on, William Lord Garrison became a little bit more radical uh, and started talking about the importance of, of really protesting and, 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 and forcing the hand. And then you had John Brown, you see. Uh, and, and the importance of this uh, is that for people looking uh, uh, at, the, at the, the commitment of whites to this struggle, okay, all, with all the warts and blemishes and, and, and what have you, uh, it's important to, um, uh, to understand uh, John Brown's role. One other thing, and I'll get right to you. One other thing, when I was, in, when I was an undergraduate, and, and Dwight, you probably, you know, and some of you might, well, no, you wouldn't. Um, <laughs> but John Brown was demonized in the historical literature. I was, I, was, I was trained as an undergraduate to think of him as really weird. You know, any white guy who would commit, you know, his life and the life of his family, his, his sons, to help black folk, to free black folk, you see, he must be sick. 
Okay, so that was my orientation. Until I got into graduate school, <coughs> and then there was a whole new uh, 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 generation of research on, on John Brown, you see. And it's not justifying what he, what he did, it's that we're trying to understand the evolution of black-white cooperation in the pursuit of racial justice. And so it's a developmental thing. As yeah. let, let me say this, just in, in, in terms of professional honesty. You know, um, historians, they have little niches. <laughs> All, you know, scholars, they have niches of expertise. Of okay. Um, and when I, when I heard Celeste talking about, about that, I have, I have uh, <clears throat> friends, when I was in the history department, who were specialists in slavery. And they would deal with all the nuances and, and, and what have you. And I could imagine that some of them uh, would probably say, well, OK, if we are, if we are looking at this within the context of, of, of slavery uh, and we're comparing you know, slave masters, then we can deal with nuance. Okay? But what I'm trying to do with this research, and I can understand your question, it's a very important question. I'm trying to understand uh, the history of interracial, multiracial unity, okay, for racial justice. You see, I'm really trying to flesh that out. And it, it has a lot of problems, as, 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 as you know. And so that would take me a little bit afield. It's a legitimate question. I don't know if we have any people here who are, who are you know, uh, slave experts or, or, or what have you. Uh, but, but, and, and plus, it would take us out of the context of interracial cooperation because the slave master situation is, you know, that subordinate, you know, ordinate uh, a, a relationship, a vertical kind of rela relationship. And so, um, and even comparing uh, slave masters, there's still some serious questions there that I can't quite address because I'm not familiar with the literature enough. You know, uh, does, that make, does, does that make sense? You see, if I were to speculate on it, it would, you know, but it, uh, I've got a lot of questions. Though. But, but I don't want to go too far afield with this, folks. You know, as, as, as you know, Smitty and I are, are, are working on a project, and, 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 and he was constantly telling me, you can appreciate this, stay on message, stay on message, stay on message. Oh, oh, okay, so I'll just add just one other thing. Just one thing, one example of good slave owner in context is slave owners who violated the law <coughs> in order to teach their inside slaves to read and write. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's a whole lot of context here that good and bad don't quite fit. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and not to, um, yeah, yeah. There's a there's a there's a vast literature, and this question would have to be discussed within that within that that context. And I'm glad you you know, for, you know for, for you know for your work, it would be really some you know important to tease that out, and the raise and the and the raise some some you know some 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 questions about it. Yes, Rebecca. I know you're trying to get back to your main okay, that's okay. I'll be brief, but I just But there's a lot, you know, you, you look at the Grimke sisters. This is it, okay. okay. These, were, these were sisters uh, of a slave owner, right? Okay. Um, and um, uh, they became abolitionists and played a very important role in, uh, in educating their nephew. They found their nephew. You know, when we think about Grimke, yeah, in fact, before, I, before one of my white graduate students in women's studies, when I was working on, on that, that book, uh, she said, you know what, Richard, you need to know more about <laughs> women and, and, and the Grimke sister. So, so she, you know, she, she made me read that big book and she, you know, so I, before I could finish the, the project. But it was so interesting because of the transformation that she went through. Okay? And she came from a slave you know, background. 
Okay, the, I don't know how we can interrogate that uh, in terms of what that what, what that tells us. But there's there's, there's a whole field of research uh, that I'm sure slave uh, uh, scholars, not slave scholars, slave, but ex, you know you know people who are who are who, yeah research yeah okay. okay. Okay, now here's another example. Um, the Civil War Alliance of Black Soldiers and White Officers. Okay, interracial experience in war influenced racial attitudes of white officers. Uh, black soldiers developed trust in and respect for white officers. Um, Kessler talks about how with the organization of men and women, Negro and white, foreign born and Native American with no uh, practice of religion or political discrimination. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this is the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor became more than a labor union, but a popular movement. Now that's during the post-Civil War period. So you have two important periods here. You've got the Civil War Alliance of Black Soldiers and White Officers. That, that's one example. Uh, and then you've got the post-Civil War period, and you guys are already familiar with Reconstruction and some of the problems there, and the short attempt at interracial uh, democracy. And here again, this is a an incredible period, uh, uh, the study. Then you have the Knights of Labor, uh, and that um, uh, uh, sort of re reflects the role uh, of, um, of black and white workers uh, in one of the first uh, labor organizations. And so these examples, as, 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 as we look at these chain of examples, do you all see any particular uh, uh, common theme uh, running through them uh, so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, and you know, it still it still mattered, but but the thing about it is that it forced it, you know these crises forced uh, folk to come together. Okay. Uh, it wasn't always as permanent as we would like, uh, but at least it showed some degree of uh, uh, of, uh, of interaction. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Captains and first sergeants, mm. you know, they really interact. You know, mm -hmm. first sergeant of the Civil War represent 80 African soldiers in the United States Colored Troops. Mm -hmm. and the captain would be the European descent officer, often 18, 17 years old, trained right here in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mm. those people seem to have a particularly mm -hmm. interesting relationship. That's why I didn't know if, if your study yeah. had looked at the, who were amongst that body of mm -hmm. people really moved forward. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. In fact, the only thing that I uh, that I did um, was um, let me. When I looked at, I think I have the the citation here. I was oh god, uh, just a second. No, I was I was looking at the broader. Uh, am I going? I was looking at the broader context of just of just. Soldiers, you know, uh, working together. You're right. Obviously, the hierarchy, you know, is 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 uh, is is is, is, uh, uh, is very important. But but I was just trying to understand that arena of interaction. Yeah. But those nuances, most certainly, that you mentioned are, you know, are important. You're probably familiar with. Uh, I was okay. It's okay. Unless you, uh, you can also uh, look up that citation uh, in there as well, and see what uh, you know what I what I did with that. But that's also that's also similar to uh, black black soldiers. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, black soldiers, white officers during the Revolutionary War. You see, yeah. So that that. Uh, Stratification in terms of officers and first sergeants and all of that—that that is, that that is that that is key. Everybody knows about the um, NAACP, okay? Uh, and the um, how this was uh, and still is uh, one of the oldest uh, civil rights uh, organizations. Um, the longest record of interracial and multiracial cooperation and, and unity. It was called the the New Abolitionists. You see, and 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 you have Morfield Story and uh, Mary White Ovington and and W. B. Du Bois, and there was still some conflict within the NAACP among, you know, um, the various uh, 
uh, black and white uh, members. And you all know the, uh, the conflict that W.B. Du Bois had uh, with some of the officers of the NAACP. But what does it represent? It represents here again a developmental phase of interracial uh, uh, cooperation. The Baha'i the Baha community is another model. Before I retired, I taught a course called uh, uh, the, um, uh, the History of a Multiracial uh, Faith Community, so, um, uh, Race Relations in the Baha'i Community, um, uh, you know, in the, in, in the 20th century. And basically, uh, you know, I was, uh, it was a history seminar with seniors, and I was trying to uh, show them a model. Uh, of a faith organization and some of the struggles uh, that it uh, had as it was trying to develop a, a multiracial uh, society, you see. These are two interesting examples. Um, when we look at this interracial coalition in the Democratic Party, um, we see um, two very important features that, that, that uh, we need to understand. One is white political expediency. Okay, you have all of these African Americans migrating north, right, during World War I. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, sizing up uh, or, de or developing sizable communities uh, in northern areas. And so obviously uh, the Democratic Party in the 1930s was looking to tap into that. And then black demands within the coalition that would take place in the 40s and the 50s uh, and what have you. In this, in this Sage book, uh, I, I talk about uh, black expectations and demands within these coalitions. I can't, you know, talk about all that, that now uh, because I think it's very important to understand that as we see the development of these multiracial, you know, uh, coalitions and organizations, what have you, within these organizations and coalitions, there's all kinds of tension going on, you see. And that's important to understand because uh, we can't assume that just because you have blacks and whites working together that you don't have that tension, you see. And so when we were doing research on the book, uh, it became clear um, as we were having these weekly seminars uh, to uh, tease these things out. You know, the students would come in and they would say, you know, uh, uh, you're talking about, let's say, the abolitionists, but these are some issues, you know, that was going on within the abolitionist uh, movement. Or you're talking about the labor movement, interracial cooperation in the labor movement, the Knights of Labor, uh, um, uh, and, and, and the wobblies, you see, uh, whatever. But still, there was these tensions. So I don't want to give people the impression, and we didn't want to give people the impression that we was this sort of Pollyannist talking about, well, people were just working together throughout this, this history. You have that, but you also have these developmental tensions and what have you. Same thing happened in the Baha'i faith. The early years of the Baha'i community, for example, in Washington, D.C., uh, experienced challenges with racial segregation, you see. Uh, and these things had to be, had to be worked out, uh, you know, throughout the, uh, uh, the years. Okay. And then you had, um, um, even though some people don't like to um, put this within this, uh, this framework, but the American Communist Party played a very important role in interracial uh, uh, cooperation. You know, we think of historians like Abthacker, you know, uh, Herbert Abthacker, who for years um, uh, published the documentary history of, of, of African Americans, you see, and we, you know, just a great history. Uh, uh, might have been, you know, some of the other works might have been skewed a bit, but, but uh, he was a very important uh, historian. Uh, they represented sort of a form of radical interracialism, you see. Uh, and they tended to be critical of other interracial uh, organizations. But interestingly enough, they influenced the policy of the Congress of Industrial Unions. When you really start to think of the union movement in the 1930s, you cannot dismiss the role of the communists. So black and white communists, you know, played a very important role. 
uh, John Lewis, president of the CIO, knowingly hired members of the Communist Party to work as organizers, primarily because of their special interest in the unity of black and white labor and their achievement of such unity uh, in the union set up by the Trade Union um, uh, Unity League. And that, you know, that's something to think about. And people who deal with race relations, sometimes they want to get rid of the, you know, uh, uh, the Communist Party and the Socialist Party, but they're part of this history, you see, and so we have to uh, uh, remember uh, the role that, they, that they've played, you see. How much time? What is my time? You about, about 25 minutes. Oh, okay. Okay, all right. And then you have the Highlander uh, a Folk School, uh, developed a residential educational program designed to help build a broad-based, racially integrated, politically active labor movement in the South, fully integrated workshop in 1942. In 1953, uh, school change focused from labor to civil rights movement. And I have a lot, of, of, uh, a lot more detail on, on, on some of these movements in, 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 the, in the, uh, the SAGE book. Here again is where my students were so helpful, okay? I had students who, uh, there was one, uh, uh, a white student uh, from an all-white community in Michigan. And I remember as an undergraduate, uh, she asked if she could do any work on race relations and, 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 and study, you know, black history and what have you. I never forget the conversation outside of the, uh, in the hallway. She said, do you think that Professor Thompson that I could study race relations? You know, I'm white, not from the suburbs. She, you know, she, she, you know, she's doing great work. I had the honor of hooding her you know, when she got her PhD, even though I wasn't one of her major uh, uh, professors, uh, about uh, six months ago. And she and some other folks were the ones who told me about the Highland Folk School. I knew about them, but they had really done a lot more work with this. And one of my, one of my white students was also um, spending time in the South with some of these, uh, with these organizations. And so, you know, I can't emphasize enough what, what happened when I started doing this research and asking students help? Many of them didn't want to because they said, you know, we're not, we're not interested in, in, you know, cooperation and all of that. And I could understand that. But they had already taken many courses from me over the years dealing with r the history of racism. So they knew that I knew the history of racism, but they also realized that, well, you know, we have to, maybe we should help the old professor, you know. He, He's, yeah, I don't know what he's doing, but you know, he, he might be helpful. Did you have your hands up? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. 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 Um, where was the Highlander Folk School located? Oh, my. Was it Nashville? Nashville? Check out my book. God, you know, it's in there somewhere. Good thing okay. you made this book. Yeah, yeah, because my memory is going. Yeah. <laughs> somewhere in the South. That's not good enough, is it? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Is it Alabama? Well, anyway, somebody can. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Great. Great. Okay. Yeah, you, you know, we might have certain views about progressive movements in the South, but um, um, here again, we see several uh, uh, organizations that were. Uh, unless you, you know, you and others might, might, might know, you know, know about this. Here we have the Southern Conference for Human Welfare uh, and the Southern Conference, uh, Southern Conference Educational Fund, uh, uh, founded in 1948. Uh, uh, um, the Southern Conference for Human Welfare, founded by Southern black and white liberals in Birmingham, Alabama, the primary purpose helps Southern whites to understand that to remove limitations on its black citizens was to ensure the region's uh, greater uh, prosperity, recommended radical reform, abolish, uh, 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 they recommended to abolish the poll tax, uh, and in 1948 passed torch to the Southern Conference Educational Fund. Uh, the Southern Con Conference Educational Fund, uh, founded in 1948, played a key role in the integration of schools, particularly in higher education and voter registration dr drive uh, uh, in, the, in the South.
this is this is one uh, example that I'm particularly uh, uh, just very fond of. The Church for the Fellowship of All People in San Francisco, <coughs> founded in 1944, the nation's first interracial, uh, interfaith uh, uh, congregation. Uh, they might be kind of off, you know, there, because we could say that the Baha'i faith was probably, uh, uh, you know, one of the, the first. Um, uh, the mission to share in the spiritual growth and ethical awareness of men and women of varied national, cultural, racial, and creedal uh, heritage united in a religious fellowship. Co-founder Howard Thurman. How many people know about ha uh, Howard Thurman? Okay, a very, very famous black theologian. Okay, one of the most famous, well-known black theologians. See, he's deceased now. Okay, and of course you know about the uh, the civil rights movement. One of the things that excited my generation in the 1960s, even though we were conflicted uh, because we had both Malcolm X as our hero, you see, and Martin Luther King as, you know, so we were, we were conflicted in the, uh, 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 in the 60s. But you, you know, this notion of the beloved community uh, really meant a lot uh, to us. Uh, I think I told some of you about when uh, 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 black and white uh, Baha'i youth went to uh, Greenville, South Carolina uh, in 1964, you see, and the black Baha'is stayed with the white Baha'is, um, and, and, and the white Baha'is stayed with the black Baha'is, and it was my first uh, extended visit to the South, and I was petrified. I was very, very nervous, and I can say this now, uh, so you might have to, you know, uh, but I remember staying with a white Baha'i um, um, uh, a, a pediatrician and lawyer, and they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, lock their doors. They said, you know, people, you know, some people pass through. They don't have any place to stay. You know, and, and black folk, you know, some black people when they pass through, they don't have any place to stay. So we leave the doors open. Well, I'm this kid from Detroit, <laughs> you see, uh, 1964, and I'm thinking. Uh, you know, I'm in the South, and I don't know about the, and at that time, the Klan, you know, you had Jonestown, you know, in, in that area, and you also had the Klan, and sometimes they would, they would send, you know, menacing notes to us, you know, when we were having a little black and white uh, meeting. And so, friends, forgive me, I'm confessing now, 40-something years later, um, I would go down when, when they were, I would lock the door. I said, I said, no. <laughs> I said, maybe they can just knock a little. <laughs> but I can't, I cannot, you know, this is, I'm, I'm the only black person in this all-white household, you see, and I just got to, you know, so I'll just listen, and if I hear somebody, you know, <laughs> like I'll, I'll, I'll come. But that, that was a very important um, uh, uh, experience. Um, and um, this notion of the beloved community meant a lot to us. Uh, uh, Northern white students working in the South, the Freedom Summer of, of, uh, of 64, and that's one reason why we, you know, some of us uh, uh, went there. And there's some other stories that, you know, I, maybe I can, I can share with you. Multiracial, multi-faith freedom marches, the impact of the black movement on interracialism, you see, in civil rights uh, 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 organizations. And so this movement is important mainly for my generation because it's so informed our notion of race relations, and it was our first example of uh, interracial cooperation. I remember uh, one Sunday uh, in uh, 19, the summer of 1964, this was, we didn't know if those three civil rights workers, you know, uh, uh, had died, they had gone missing. But this was also the summer when they, when, when in Athens, Georgia, they killed that black captain. And so there was a lot of violence going on. And I can recall uh, David Rue, bless him, who had just passed. Uh, um, I mean, Doug Rue, Doug Rue. Doug Rue and I decided, uh, Doug was a, a white Baha'i, we decided that we were going to go uh, to a restaurant and have breakfast, you see, and we figured if we went on Sunday, you know, uh, the people wouldn't, uh, 
we should have seen this. You know, we, we, didn't, we didn't know what. We were probably naive, but we figured, we figured they wouldn't have so much dissonance. You know? They probably would have just dragged. But we sat there. You know, you're this tall, you know, sort of blonde, you know, white behind, you know, kid and, and this black kid from Detroit. And we're sitting there and I and I could see the I could see the cooks, the black cooks kind of looking out. But what was so interesting was that the white waitress came through and served us and smiled at us. OK, but, you know, that was sort of our little thing in, 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 in 1964, experiencing or, or trying to make sense of uh, or to validate. Uh, interracial cooperation in the Baha'i faith in that setting because it was easy to sit around and sing and you know and play the good time we were doing up north okay but when we got down there with southern with southern black southern and white black Baha'is they were on the front lines and it was it was really something to you know to have that experience and they were a part of this beloved community because they had been there for decades uh, doing you know doing that uh, doing that work, you see. A reading on my time again? Uh, in about 14 minutes. Okay, all right. Now, as you know from the beginning, you know, when I first started uh, uh, the talk, th th these are the organizations that have been so important to me over the years, okay? Just being from uh, Detroit and all of the racial problems in, uh, in Detroit. Can someone read, can, so, can, you, can you see that? Can, can, yeah, will someone read, uh, someone read the, this mission statement and then the other one. This, these are great. Uh, and these are interracial and multiracial organizations in the post-civil disorder era. Okay, all right, okay. Okay, I'm gonna do it. Okay, all right. Um, Black and white, yellow, brown, and red from Detroit and its suburbs, suburbs of every economic status, national origin, and religious persuasion. We join in the covenant. Friends, I love this organization. I really, really love this organization. This organization is, if you ever uh, 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 get to Detroit and you're interested in race relations, check out Focus Hope, okay? Because it is an example of not just people coming together. It's an example of economic development. Because uh, uh, Focus Hope established, um, they've got an industrial technical center that they developed to train minority uh, folk. They have a Montessori school uh, for the workers, you see. Uh, it's a very, Im very impressive uh, 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 multiracial um, uh, 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 a project, and it includes all kinds of, of, of people. You see, um, when 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 I, I was teaching, I would always take my students down there to see <coughs> Father Cunningham. And here you had this white-haired man who was so energetic, and he would take you on a tour, you know, of the of the project. And 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 Mrs. Uh, uh, Eleanor Josephus was also very much. Uh, uh, involved. Now, what about someone reading this one? Because this is another uh, organization that came out of the uh, uh, the riots. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, multicultural leadership series. This experience highlights the histories, cultures, and socioeconomic issues of five communities of color: African, African American. Arab, Chaldean, Asian, Hispanic, Latino, and Native American applicants will represent people of various racial, ethnic, and cultural communities in the region and will serve as liaisons in the community for metropolitan Detroit. Now, the reason why this is important, for folk, is that the demographics of Detroit uh, have changed radically uh, in the last uh, 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 40 years. Um, you had uh, the, the major uh, uh, area of conflict for years was blacks and whites and then blacks in the suburbs and then you know blacks in the inner city. As a result of the riots uh, as you, and white flight as well as black upper class and middle class uh, flight, uh, you were left in large part with a marginal black population 
uh, the stores left, the big chain supermarkets left, and in their, their places uh, 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 came a Chaldean uh, Christian, Iraqi Christians, okay, um, setting up stores. And so there was all kinds of conflict between them, you see, and that conflict is still going on. Uh, and much of the work of racial reconciliation and what have you, uh, and what these people are doing so well, is bringing these two uh, communities uh, together, uh, you see, uh, because it's, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of tension there. And so that's, that's, that's something that um, uh, my colleagues and I at Michigan State, uh, we, you know, we've been working on this type of work for, uh, for, for, for many years. Okay, this is the last, this is the last, uh, or next to the last slide, it might be the, the multiracial unit. This is an example of what uh, my former student and I um, worked on. How many people remember the, the O.J. Simpson trial and all of the conflict after that? You remember that? All the tension and what have you? I was on sabbatical at the time and decided to stay on campus because there was so much conflict. And so along with uh, uh, one of my graduate students, PhD student who was a Baha'i, uh, and, 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 and some of my, you know, my other uh, students, we decided to uh, uh, develop this project. Uh, and it offered us, uh, here, somebody read that. Yeah. Now, one of the things that we did, that we made sure that students were engaged in service projects, okay? And, and you know, we would, we, would, we would break bread together. If you know anything about the research on, on, on uh, race relations on campuses uh, and in the residence halls, you know that uh, if you go into a residence hall, uh, in, on, on some, some college campuses, uh, the students are separated. Uh, I, for, I forget this book, uh, uh, or the title of, I mean, I mean the, uh, the author of the book, who wrote, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting uh, Together? Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 okay. And that most certainly was going on on our campus. And in the wake of the, the O.J. Simpson verdict, I mean, you could, cu you know, cut the air the proverbial air with a proverbial night. It was just so incredibly thick. And so we decided, rather than disengage from it, we decided, particularly given the fact that we were doing race relations and that we were Baha'i faculty, that we were going to do something, okay? And so we started organizing kids, um, and we convinced some of the professors to allow us uh, to talk to the students about what they were going to do. You see, uh, and Ed, you would appreciate this. Uh, first of all, we hit them with a little guilt. We said, you know, these are the things that we did in the 60s. Okay, uh, what are you guys going to do now? We got to pass the torch to you. What role are you going to play to address these issues? And so we said, what we would like for you to do is, number one, is to have dinner once a week, all of you together with, you know, several faculty members. And then after that, we would we'll go and we will uh, try to discuss these issues. And the con, you know, the issues that we discussed were really, really painful. Affirmative action was one, okay. Um, uh, 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 the whole use of the N word was another. Uh, interracial dating was another. I mean, it was very, very difficult. Uh, after we moved them through that process, we took them on field trips uh, to various uh, places. In the end, um, uh, we took them to South Africa where we taught a course on comparative race relations uh, and um, had a chance to interact with various folk there. Uh, after I retired, my former student who you know, had finished her PhD started taking these students back to South Africa to build homes. 
you know, uh, she was very, she got them involved in the, in the, uh, in the various uh, uh, AIDS uh, projects uh, in South Africa. And I was never so proud of her when she called and said, we're at the airport and we're on our way, you know, to South Africa uh, to build homes for some of the, for some of the orphans. So, um, uh, and so, and this is still going on. If you guys um, uh, have a chance, you can, you can uh, Google this. Uh, and, and her name is Dr. Jean Cazell. And, and she's still doing great work. This is the last one, and then we'll have some questions. Okay. All right. Now here, here are the questions that 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 uh, that can help to uh, stimulate some takeaway. What is the vision? What are the needs? What types of strategies, actions, and alliances should we develop? How can we understand the history of interracial, multiracial cooperation? Or how can understanding the history of interracial, multiracial cooperation help us in this in this process? You see, and so this is what I what I try to um, get people to think about in terms of uh, things that needs uh, uh, to be done. You see, so any questions? And you can address either, you know, these uh, questions, or you can just, if you have any comments or questions, what have you? Okay, okay. Okay, Doc, I was going to ask you, I wrote this down just so I can read some slides. Um, just wondering if the group is still happening at Michigan State mm -hmm. and um, thinking about this Trayvon Martin thing, I think it's going to be like the new O.J. Bird of Truth, mm -hmm. um, really trying to encourage people yeah. to get ready for acquittal. That's been my line of yeah. um, and so requests and suggestions to folks. So I, I, mm -hmm. I'm going to leave that, but I was going to ask you, as a person trying to build a multiracial uh, movement, mm -hmm. bringing folks together around these issues. I think what I see historically is kind of a mixed bag where there's mm -hmm. some stuff done and it seems mm -hmm. to be a fizzle kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Always trying to wonder what's causing the fizzle. Mm -hmm. And what I've come up with, and this is what I'm asking you, is mm -hmm. there's no focus. Mm -hmm. The start, starting of the building around racism, I think, isn't at the source, and so therefore, if you're not starting at the source, you get some good things done at this beginning, but mm -hmm. it will eventually fizzle. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the source is white supremacy, mm -hmm. white power, right? Like that doesn't seem to be a part of what people are willing to examine, mm -hmm. and it's essential because, <coughs> as I go back to my point, what I feel like I face the biggest challenge around trying to build this multiracial new unit yeah. is people influenced by supremacy. Mm -hmm. Like not used to seeing a person of color in power. Yeah, yeah. So they'll come into the movement, uh -huh. feel good about what we're doing, but then when I'm giving the instructions, when uh -huh. I'm giving the, mm -hmm. you know, not in an authoritative way, but in the leader way of the person yeah. that's part of that, mm -hmm. there seems to be mm -hmm. some friction there, and then they bounce out because yeah. they can't be in charge. <coughs> yeah. That's some of what I'm asking you as I, mm -hmm. you know, continue to learn from you and mm. challenge you around some of the damning <laughs> piece, but also want to hear, listen, and yeah. learn. But yeah. feeling like that's what I keep experiencing. Yeah. Is folks influenced by a system yeah. that doesn't necessarily allow them to stay in it for longevity. Like, yeah. yeah. You know, you know uh, that is, uh, Eddie, that is so key. Um, you know, at one point, I was very disillusioned with the whole race piece, mm -hmm. you know, because I had been teaching it for years, and I was training teachers, and I never will forget uh, uh, there were a bunch of white teachers complaining, and I blew, and I said, I'm tired of all this white whining, and I had one of my PhD students there, and she reminded me, she said, you know, you said it about twice, Richard, you know, are you okay, you know? and. It was, it was the whole burnout thing, because I had been doing it since the 60s, you know. And when you do it decade after decade, um, I, I think what burns you, what burns you out is the fact that some of the same problems, that, you know, keep coming. But you know, I think about A. Philip Randolph, and I think about these, uh, these brothers and sisters, 
uh, who stayed in the movement for so long. Whenever I, whenever I would get tired and upset and I would talk to some of these old folk, they would say, you know, Richard, we've been doing this since 40. You know, we've been in the labor movement since 1940. You, you, you know, how old are you, son? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, back, you know, I said, well, I'm 40 something. Well, let me tell you what happened in 32 when we were trying to organize, you know. You. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. And so I think what it is, um, you have to press them on it, okay. And I think in a loving and firm way, uh, you have to make sure that they address it because here again, it's a developmental uh, a kind of a piece. When we were, when we were um, uh, 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 training or preparing our students, we had four years to work with them, okay? Um, and uh, gradually they would come to understand some things, but they kept going back to, you know, we would test them in certain, in, in certain areas, you see? Because it's developmental. And so I, I think we just have to, you know, continue to do the work. What I've tried to do, I've tried to stay connected uh, with organizations that have a long history. Focus Hope has experienced some of the things that you're doing, but they've been around for over 40 something years. And so when you talk to those black and white folk in that organization, uh, and you see, for example, that they're training black kids, you know, you go into that shop and you see them training, you know, uh, black technicians and, 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 and what have you, uh, you can't help but, but appreciate that. So I can understand those issues that you're talking about. But I think that, as I mentioned earlier, it's a protracted struggle. It's a protracted struggle. And, and you're still young, Eddie. You're still young. I'm 73, man. I mean, I'm tired. Ah, you see, you got to take over the torch. <laughs> but I can, I can, you know, I can understand. One last, one last, uh, 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 and then I ha I'll get some more questions. To show you how these problems are persistent. I, I taught at Michigan State for 38 years. I retired when I was 70 years old. And I was so happy to, you know, to leave. And, and two black faculty members came to me. One was going up for full pro professorship, and the other was going up for associate professor. And they said, uh, you got to stick up around Rich long enough because you're the only black full professor left, you see. Uh, so you got to stick around long enough, you know, to help us get tenure. And I never will forget walking into that last meeting and people looking at me as if to say, oh my God, we know why he's back, mm -hmm. you know. You know, we thought he retired, but he's emeritus, and we know why he's back. He's back to protect these young black, black faculty. And I knew that they felt that way, but that didn't bother me because I knew what I had to do, you see. And so at, at, at one point, I think we have to realize, and this is where the history helps out, okay? We have to realize that it's a protracted struggle, you see. Uh, and, and like I said before, whenever, you know, I found myself getting tired in the 60s and the 70s, uh, I would think of A. Philip Randolph. I would think of these, you know, uh, uh, th these folk who've been in the struggle for years. Uh, and I was figured, well, you know, uh, I just got to stick it out. So you're a warrior, brother. You know, you got, you got to do yeah. <laughs> I think, too, that a lot of white people said, you can see, yeah. see where that leads. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I just say one other thing? I, I probably, oh, no, no, okay. okay. What has been very, and I'm glad you mentioned it, planting seeds, you know, in, in, in young whites. What really, really, really warmed my heart over the 30 some years that I, that I, that I taught was uh, 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 being at a reunion and seeing my black and white students say, you know, we still connected with so and so. You know, we're still doing some great work. And we produced some radical black, I mean, uh, black and white students. You know, you know, our students were out there doing some incredible uh, things. One of my white students who was very, going through some racist, you know, uh, uh, situations in the classroom, when, when, when we finally got him out of that, that particular situation, he went to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, all white. So here's this little blind, you know, a blue-eyed kid. And he called me one day, and he said, Professor Thomas, how are you doing? I said, fine, you would not believe what I'm doing. And I'm teaching race relations up here in the, up here in the UP. Oh. And he remembered an example that we had in the class. We read, we read, um, um, it's a book, it's not by Maslow, the book on prejudice. Is it Maslow or the, uh, uh, 
all poetry. Greg Ellsworth, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we read that book on, uh, and he has a concept in there called refencing. You probably remember that concept. Where, for example, if you're really prejudiced, and then, uh, you know, if I should say, well, you know, uh, 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 you know, Ed is a great quarterback. Uh, and it, if, if you, and Ed go, goes out there and perform, then I say, wow, you know, you, know, you know, I was racist. I didn't think, you know, uh, he could do some of the things that he could, you know, that, that he's doing, you know. Well, he's great, but he's not that great, but, you know, he, he's doing all right. Then maybe after five or six years, I would say, okay, about if I were president, well, I guess, you know, black folk can make great quarterbacks. But now if, I, if, I'm, if it's really deeply ingrained, then I'll start refencing. I'll say, well, you know, only reason why, you know, the, you know Ed is a, a, a great, great uh, quarterback is that his grandfather's white. You know, and uh, and so his, his you know he's you know he's kind of you know he's kind of mixed, and so that's why he's a, that's refencing, mm -hmm. you know. And so this young this young white kid, when we talked about that in the class, came back to the class, and this was an all white class. Many of my classes were all white for years, <laughs> okay. Uh, and then gradually I got some, you know, because some of the black students said, "Man, we don't want to be talking about racism." But then gradually the black students came in, okay, but. But, but one of the things that helped him was that, who was this great black um, uh, quarterback, one of the first, uh, 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 was it William? Doug William. Doug William. And so he told the story of Doug Williams. He said, you know, Professor Tom, and he told the whole class. He said, my father never believed that blacks could make great quarterbacks. He said, but when he saw Doug Williams, you know, he got rid of his, you know, you know, that, that, now he, he didn't cease being racist, but at least he was willing to let go of that particular racial stereotype. Now, now this white kid is up in the UP, and he's telling me years later, I'm really testing my students. They're all white, duh. but you know what? You know, I'm, I'm really teaching them, and thanks a lot. Now, that was a seed, and I remember when, when I walked into that class and they saw a black professor, my first, the first thing I said to them, I know you kids have never had a black professor, all right? So don't drop out, because you need to know about this. You need to know about these things. I'm not going to beat up on you. You can see them sitting there, you know, taking out, you know, figuring out, well, we better drop this class. And once I kept them there past the drop <laughs> session, you see, then we started getting into these things. And, and, and these kids, many of these kids started doing race relations research, started becoming involved in the project, and when we started, the multiracial unity project, um, we would give them extra credit. This is how you use the academic piece. We would give them extra credit if they became involved in some service, you see, and that gave them even more investment mm -hmm. in, in racial change, you see. And so these, so you're planting some great seeds, you know, and you will harvest them in the future, but you're still young, man. At 40, at your age, man, I was, I was still huffing and puffing. No. <laughs> okay, any other? Uh, any other? Uh, we out of time. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Thank you guys. Okay, I'm sorry, but it went over. <laughs>